So I want to talk to you now about a very important topic, probability distributions. And I will emphasize that this is maybe I, maybe it's hyperbole, the most important idea, not in the world, but it's an extremely important idea um, that is relied upon throughout this course, um, or at least is there in the background in a essential kind of foundational way. And it is really important um, in understanding and effectively communicating ideas um, and results from data an analysis and um, when using statistical quantitative computational models. And it is often, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important topic in mathematical statistics and there are whole courses, uh, an introduction to or second course in probability uh, that focuses on uh, properties of probability distributions and uh, at, at much greater uh, intensity than we are going to do. We can't do it justice, but I wanna make sure that we uh, get a handle on this and, um, and kind of keep coming back to it as, as something foundational and uh, remind ourselves about what probability distributions are and how they're used in the course of, um, you know, in, in, in doing an effective job of uh, communicating randomness, uncertainty, the nature of stochastic models. Uh, otherwise, we tend to think of what we're doing here in computational social science or um, quantitative uh, political science as uh, inaccurately a kind of like deterministic process where we're imagining the world as taking in predictor variables, independent variables, and spitting out um, uh, uh, outcomes, right? Which is really not fundamentally what's going on. And the, the uh, strength of these, these models are that they allow for heterogeneity and uh, variation, but can talk about the ways in which um, distributions of outcomes can be constrained, uh, at least probabilistically, uh, by uh, certain circumstances by certain contexts, right? Uh, so it's easy to be confused by this concept and actually uh, much of misunderstanding and statistical inference or those who use it, social scientists and other practitioners springs from, from confusion about what these things are and, and the fact that you know, we're kind of at the intersection between social science and, um, and quantitative methods. And so we're not going to again, delve in as deeply as uh, might be useful in, uh, on the technical side. Uh, so it starts with this question of well, two questions, but the, the first one's in the question uh, that we're maybe more familiar with and think about uh, often instinctively when talking about distributions, uh, and that's distributions of data. So how am I going to summarize um, my raw data on, a, you know, uh, I collect information, I measure, uh, observations with respect to certain variable, education, income, number of casualties in a conflict, um, uh, rolls of toilet paper that <laughs> purchased during a period, you know, any of those things, how do I, how do I characterize that, that those data that we have? Uh, and obviously just giving you thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of uh, data points is not going to be inf interesting. It's not going to be communicative. So we usually think about summarizing those, and it generally comes down to different versions of um, it, the the question of um, how to describe or visualize those values in a in, in a way that had that demonstrates patterns. And sometimes we fixate on particular one number summaries, like a mean or median or mode for central tendencies, standard deviation or range for um, variability for dispersion uh, and other descriptors like skew and so on or we might try to do a, some kind of picture that captures them all and if we understand what we're looking at we can get a lot of information from those might give little bits of information like uh you know um well uh, I'll, I'll leave the idiosyncratic ones aside because i don't want to overemphasize them um Statisticians refer to this kind of distribution as an empirical distribution, right? So distribution of the values actually observed. And 
we are interested in this and this alone is actually inferences we may draw just, just we think of this as descriptive statistics uh, in nature of course and um and that's all well and good and not very controversial if we make some statements i mean it may be controversial whether we did measuring correctly or whether we're lying about our data but but actually just saying here's my data here's some summaries of it here's my empirical distribution um, does not get us into murky waters. What gets us into murkier waters, but important waters for um, generalizing and for thinking more broadly and for theorizing uh, is what we mean when we refer to theoretical probability distribution of a random variable, or I, I try to take some of these out, this notation from a previous book. Sometimes, occasionally I may capitalize data and this is like the concept of data before we've actually captured it, right? So. So sometimes you might think of it as like the population distribution or a data generating process and the data that are being, you know, uh, created by those processes or by nature, by um, the world turning and things happening and we collect hypothetical data, right? So if I have some residual all caps data, that's what I'm talking about. And it's the sort of, um, before seeing the specific data, which I use lowercase for, um, what, how do we talk about the distribution of all data that could ever be generated according to the process we're studying? And so we can do this with a description uh, or visualization again, uh, but now instead of the actual data we're observing, we're talking about all possible values that the random variable in question may take on and the probabilities of any subset, not the frequency or relative frequency, because we haven't seen it yet. And we're not, that's sort of a, a, a specific, you know, based in actual observation question. This is a, um, a more abstract one. And so just, you know, to make a little more concrete, right? If I, if my data include ages, I'm interested in uh, age distributions of uh, Latinos in New England, and I take a random sample and, um, and I, have some number of seven-year-olds, some number of eight-year-olds, by chance I have no nine-year-olds, right? In my description of my data and the, the distribution, it will be essentially, you know, no nine-year-olds or 0% of Latinos in New England in my sample are nine-year-olds. But when I'm talking about the population distribution or, you know, the sort of larger universal, uh, I know nine-year-olds is a possibility. <laughs> right. Even if in the population actually itself, uh, right now, just for some fluke, uh, we didn't observe or we, we, we don't have any nine year olds now, or, or you can think about this like if it's a continuous random variable, maybe at this exact moment, we don't have any people, uh, any Latinos, if that's what I'm uh, the group that I'm studying, who are nine years 17 days and 6.3 hours, but we want to allow that to be some hypothetical age. We don't want to just simply eliminate anything that we don't happen to be seeing now, right? So uh, we're switching our sort of mindset in, in this world of a theoretical probability distribution to all the possible values a, a variable could take on um, and the probabilities of any subset. I want to be able to answer questions like, what's the probability? Um, if I select someone from this population at random, that they'll be between ages seven and 10. Uh, so the distinction then again, in uh, one way of putting it is empirical distribution, the data observed, um, mostly lowercase, I capitalized the D, but sorry, uh, theoretical distribution, right? The model, the, uh, the uh, abstract, the hypothetical, the thing that we're actually trying to learn about with statistical inference um, is about this underlying uh, model. And uh, again, to emphasize in the former case of distribution of values within the data set itself, uh, we are talking about values that are actually taken on, like what, what value, if I actually uh, were in R to make a table of all, all the values, it would say, it would, I'd be getting this distribution represented. I, it would give me each in individual number or each individual category that exists and how many observations have that particular value or category, right? Whereas uh, in the case of theoretical, I'm looking at all possible values and the probabilities of any subset or way to, cap to um, get them. Now, the first one is actually quite easy. The second one is hard. And again, and not just hard, but like, um, 
more controversy seeps in in, in, in terms of uh, more difficulty in understanding it and then disagreements over uh, how to think about this philosophically, um, which we'll not really touch on too much here. Um, so what are some different ways that we can capture distribution of observed data? I mentioned already, gave some uh, um, sort of, uh, impl it has implications. We could simply have a table, right? We could have a graph, like a histogram or a bar plot um, and summary statistics. I mentioned some of these about central tendency or dispersion or skewed, things like that, or whether it has two modes. Is it a, um, you know, we're dealing with a, uh, a distribution that like kind of looks like this, which I'm making it really smooth. So that actually is more the shape of a, what you might have a theoretical distribution, although it's weird shaped enough that it's similar to, uh, you know, in, in fact, in, in a, a data situation, we probably would have, you know, a histogram that kind of looked like something maybe like this based on data, but we might have a smoothing plot that gives us more of that sort of smoothing shape and tries to give some implications for the um, broader underlying distribution of a population or data generating. Uh, process and um, and so yeah, table as I said, you could get that in R. Or you could make it yourself. But what about theoretical probabilities? Um, typically, table doesn't work. There uh, with categorical or discrete variables, uh, it uh, may be possible. Um, I didn't write it in here, but you could have a table. If, if for example, if the theoretical distribution you're interested in is how many I'm going to flip a coin five times and how many heads do I get. I could actually say from zero for one, for two, for three, four, for five, three and four and five. Um, I can give the uh, exact uh, probabilities if it's a fair coin for all of those. And I could do that in a table. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, especially certainly if you're working with a continuous random variable, the height, heights, ages, ed, uh, incomes, uh, uh, and something approaching effectively continuous, even if it's discrete, like, number of casualties in war where you have so many possible outcomes that it's easier to sort of treat it as if it were uh, smooth and continuous, uh, even though you don't have fractions in that case. Um, graphs tend to be used, right? Some of those smooth shapes, you see normal distributions and exponential distributions and so on. Um, equation, which is one of the trickier things to think about, especially in a not very math heavy course. Um, and model parameters if uh, we have some known family like a normal distribution, a binomial distribution. Uh, um, so sometimes this is why we use these name distributions because it simplifies the act of describing a probability distribution into naming one, two, or more parameters that fully characterize that distribution and give us all the information we need. Uh, so an example of a graph, this is a generic graph for a normal distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma, you can get a sense of, and you know, we should think about also what this is communicating. Um, I recommend that you uh, look back at materials from the math um, workshop that I gave uh, this summer. We talked a little, little, little bit about this. There's also an extra video more advanced on sort of the calculus of these curves. Uh, but as a, a quick sort of shortcut, you know, we tend to think of so the heights of these curves are not actually giving us probability values, but the areas under the curves are. So uh, whatever this width is times whatever that height is, is giving me the probability of getting a value uh, between the limits on the left and right. Uh, and as a kind of rough um, uh, mnemonic, not really mnemonic, but a, a, a sort of a, a handy kind of shortcut that is loosely true. Um, getting a, drawing a, a value from this distribution that's close to say mu here, right? If that height is twice as high as say, I don't know, I'm gonna try to guess maybe somewhere around here, then whatever value of the random variable has a height on this um, distribution curve that is half the height of another one, what that's telling me our instinct is to say, you know, here, here's, here's X1 and here's, I'm not gonna write the X, but X2 
And it looks like, oh, it's twice as probable. The probability of getting X2 from this distribution is twice as much as the probability of getting X1. Strictly speaking, that's not true because the, for a continuous random variable, the probability of any exact number, any exact observation value is zero. But loosely, it's true in the sense that the probability of drawing a value close to X2 is twice the probability of um, drawing a value close to x1 if in fact the height here is twice and it looks a little bit more but twice the height of, of it there um, so the key thing is that you know this this representation is giving us some sense of more probable values uh, and less probable values and as we move standard deviations away we also know for a normal distribution that let's say the probability of being within two standard deviations of the mean is around 68%. And the probability, did I say two? I meant within one standard deviation of the mean uh, on either side. The probability of being within two standard deviations of the mean is, this is one you should probably know, 95% or um, just a, about that. And, and the probability of uh, getting a value within three standard deviations of the mean is over 99%. Uh, we, have different kinds of graphs that would be effective. If you looked at this graph, which is a cumulative distribution, it's less intuitive to look at and think, oh, I get a sense of what values are more or less probable, probable because what it's giving you is for each value, and this is a specific, uh, not a generic one, where mu is 50 and standard deviation is, is something else, I'm not sure, um, where what it's giving you is for any particular value, so for mu, mu mean mu, yeah, um, and actually, I think it should be about here. If you look at the height of this function, and typically a CDF, we use like a capital F, whereas the PDF, the probability density function, we use a little f. So these are connected with one another. Again, I go into more detail on the um, other video, on the advanced video. Uh, but when you're looking at this, what this information is, this information on the right is actually giving me probabilities. It is giving me the probability for anything on this x-axis, it's giving me the probability that we draw an x value that's less or equal to that specific x value. Here's the capital and then the lowercase again, right? So the probability that x is less than 50, well, what's the height? It's 50%, right? This is symmetric. And uh, so the median is also the, the median is also the median. If you look at a 60 and you look up at the height and maybe it's about 0.98, right? It's telling you, oops, somewhere around there, right? It's telling you the probability that X is less than or equal to that number, 60, is about 98%. And so it's also allowing you to find any, it's giving you the ability to calculate any probabilities, right? It's the probability of uh, if I want to know, hey, the probability of getting a value from this distribution uh, of between 50 and 60, it would be 98% minus 50%, it would be 48%. So it's, you can use this, um, it gives you the information, uh, although it's you know, kind of clunky to actually read that information and you're not going to get too detailed. And so we can also represent these with equations. And uh, because we're not heavily math or calculus focused here, um, this, this is sort of like a, an extra for you. You should get familiar at least with the, what these things look like and what they're doing. Um, this is an equation for a generic normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. And what is it doing? It's actually giving me instructions for the height of this curve on the left for any particular value of x. So if I fed in, a particular x value, right? And I know mu and sigma, it's going to tell me the height of this PDF. That number itself on its own, again, is not going to be super interesting because that also is just providing instructions for calculating probabilities by calculating areas under the curve. And so on its own, one specific value of x, the, out, the, the, the little f of x that comes out, the height of this, is not going to be super meaningful. But if you had two and you were comparing the outputs again, if one is twice as much as the other, it's telling you probability of getting a value near the one is about twice as likely as getting a probability of a value near the other.
Um, and similarly, uh, the value uh, we can calculate for CDF um, involves integrating. Um, so calculating the area anywhere from negative infinity to whatever specific value um, you have as an input. We're not going to be calculating these except maybe as a, um, an advanced uh, challenge exercise, but guess what? Well, let's first off talk about simplifying it saying, you know, if we know that we're dealing with a family of a family of uh, distributions that gets a name, uh, the benefit of that is that if you're, you know, if you simplify the uh, truth, the true distributions to one of these infinitely many, let's say normal distributions or exponential distributions or Poisson, any of these families of distributions, then it simplifies the matter of knowing what the distribution is to simply knowing a number or two numbers or three with a normal, it's knowing the mean and the variance or standard deviation. With the Poisson, it's knowing the rate of occurrence. With a binomial, it's you always know the number of attempts, and it's the probability of any one attempt being successful, and on and on. There's some small number of parameters that give you all the information you need, so you know the distribution if you know those numbers. And, um, and finally, we also can add to this an algorithm as a way of, of representing a distribution, and that's going to be the most uh, important to us, right? So if I use D norm, that's giving me for any X value, if I provide the mean and the standard deviation and be careful that the usual notation for normal has parameters mean and variance, which is the square of the standard deviation. R wants you to put in the more commonly used standard deviation. So the square root of that. So be careful that you get used to doing one or the other. Uh, so if you give it a mean and you give it a standard deviation, like let's say zero and one for a standard normal, then if you give it any particular value X, like two or one or 17, what is it gonna be the output? It's gonna be the height of this PDF. And you can actually use that to trace a curve using a curve function. Um, and not surprisingly, P norm is actually giving you the CDF. Um, it is actually giving you a probability, right? It is giving you the probability that X is less than or equal to, well, you can tell it, uh, here it's given as Q instead of little x. So if I give it a mean and a standard deviation, and then I say, hey, here's a Q, 17, it's gonna find the probability that X is less than or equal to 17. It's a standard normal. It's gonna be essentially uh -oh, very, 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 very close to 100%, right? So these are two ways of representing distributions. They're not the only ways, but they're the most common, right? I could represent a distribution as the probability that X is greater than a given number uh, or a number of other kind of um, ham-fisted ways. All right, I'm gonna stop there uh, for the moment and do a, a second video to continue this.